Thank you much. It's a uh, you know, just a great honor that you invited me to do this and the opportunity to be back here. This lecture hall may be refurbished, but I've talked here a few times and it still has exactly the same feel. It feels a little bit like home to me. Uh, this title reflects the three decades that Tony and Eric and I have worked together. and I'm very grateful to them all these years of their involvement and support, especially at the time I left Bristol Myers and went to Gilead. That, we were able to continue the collaboration that in our eyes had a lot of promise. That was 25 years ago, it had a lot of promise, but in the rest of the world's eyes, it really didn't. And so I'm going to sort of mix in some uh, just personal stuff of, how, of chemistry, how I feel, stuff about my uh, long collaboration with Tony. So, so you, many of you in this room were here when we uh, did this four years ago in May that we had a, uh, a celebration of our long collaboration and you can see uh, Tony was very engaged with that and it was just really a great time. Has anyone ever seen Tony without a camera? I, I certainly have it. He always has a camera. There of course is Eric talking about uh, our work together up to that point. Here's Sedenic so given Luke Miller some flowers on that occasion. You can see Tony's being attentive, and then he has thumbs up, as I've often seen him do in his life. This was uh, from some time, I actually showed this picture in 2011. This was at a Gilead Sciences Board of Directors meeting when the board presented Eric and Tony with an uh, engraved plaque. Uh, really talking about their accomplishments at that time, but also foreseeing where we would be. Viriad had been on the market less than two years at that point. Sadafavir was launched in uh, 1996. This is uh, probably the first awareness in my young career that I knew anything about Eric and Tony was dihydroxypropyl adenine, which was approved as a drug, uh, as a cream or an ointment for herpes simplex. There, there was, at this time of that publication, that, by the way, that, was, that publication came out in exactly the time I got a PhD and got my first job in the pharmaceutical industry, 1978. And there was a lot of interest in S adenosyl homocysteine hydrolase. So one of my early projects was to actually, you can see the, the first part of their molecule just goes around the bottom and I was interested in carbocyclic adenosine and how to make that, and I envisioned a plane of symmetry that was B instead of A. And it turned out to be a very straightforward synthesis of uh, singlet oxygen to that alkylated cyclopenadiene to put in the two hydroxy groups in an epoxidation. That allowed elaboration of all the functionalities of uh, carbocyclic nucleosides. And a molecule in this series that we published that had an exocyclic methylene eventually became a drug called Intecavir. I just throw this in sort of as a personal thing of my own because it was something that was inspired by the work of dihydroxypropylene. So also around this time was the uh, approval, invention and then approval of acyclovir for, like DHPA for the treatment of herpes simplex infections. I also, at that time, at Syntex, made gancyclovir, which ultimately became a drug. These molecules act by a mechanism that almost everyone in this room knows of a successive phosphorylations. So just taking acyclovir in the center, it goes to the monophosphate by a virus-specified enzyme and then to the triphosphate by cellular enzyme since triphosphate inhibits uh, the herpes simplex virus polymerase. At the time, this was viewed as highly desirable, having the selective activation virus-affected cells. And in fact, Trudy Ellion, who did this work, got the Nobel Prize for elucidating this mechanism. There is, however, concerns by being only phosphorylated in a virus-infected cell that's already producing an enzyme, you're 
playing catch up to the virus. It'd be much better to be activated in all cells and to abort viral replication in every single cell. Uh, to do that, you might envision that you'd make analogs of the monophosphate that would uh, bypass that first phosphorylation step and therefore could have many, many advantages as antivirals. It'd need to be a stable analog if just this PO bond is not stable. You give a phosphate a drug and of course phosphate falls right off. So it should be a stable analog. And so the point that I'm making is you bypass the first step of uh, phosphorylation. You can view the drug as pre-armed. It's activating all cells, so it protects those cells from the virus. Uh, it, nucleotides, as we suddenly learned, are long-lived in cells, so it allows for infrequent dosing. At the time of uh, this perspective, that we, it was just an emerging field, I was at Syntex where these two uh, fellows who uh, are like the generation and a half ahead of me that Eric and Tony are, had published on this uh, stable analog of adenosine monophosphate. And if you'd think anything would have activities in nucleotide, Tied, it would be this because A and P is involved in so many biological mechanisms. It had no activity and the conclusion was it doesn't get into cells and therefore nucleotides won't be drugs. That in fact turned out not to be case as we all happily know today. And um, what example I was working on at the time was I simply made the stable analog of GAN cyclovir monophosphate by replacing oxygen to carbon. In this case, this molecule was equally active as gancyclovir against CMV uh, in vitro and in vivo. Gancyclovir went on to be a very significant drug for the treatment of CMV. It opened up the field of transplantation for prophylaxing for CMV pneumonia in immune suppressed patients. This product never went anywhere because I left Syntex and went to Bristol Myers and then uh, at a certain moment, Eric de Klerk shows up in my office and says, Tony and I are working on these nucleotides. So at that moment, there are only a very few people in the world that knew that nucleotides uh, worked as antiviral agents. As Tony, Eric, me, and a few of our collaborators at each of our institutions. So uh, we formed a collaboration around this. I visited Eric in 1986, and I visit Tony here in Prague, May of eight, early May of 1986, and we embarked on this collaboration, which I will talk more about now, that resulted in transforming quite a few important diseases in medicine. The initial discoveries were, again, just very simple acyclic nucleotide analogs of uh, deoxyadenosine monophosphate. And the very simple change here is instead of just replacing that oxygen with a carbon, uh, there's also, it's a transposition where the oxygen is next to the carbon. And that electron withdrawing effect was the key to opening up a whole large class of nucleotide uh, compounds that have potent biological activity. I threw in this picture. Eric, do you remember this meeting? You bet. Eric, Eric chaired uh, NATO conferences over the course of quite a few years. I, Ron Borkhart gave me this slide last month, Eric, because uh, there's young Ron Borkhart. He's just retired from University of Kansas as a full-time professor. There's Tony. And there's, of course, me as a much younger man. This was uh, at a NATO conference that Eric organized every couple of years that would take two weeks somewhere in Europe and funded by NATO and entirely dedicated to antivirals. And it's one of our many experiences. Eric could tell you the name of every single person in this picture because he personally invited them all to this conference, including by that point, his very close collaborator, uh, Tony Holy. So in speaking about how uh, this phosphonomethyl ether is so critical, this is a series of experiments done by Chung Kim. Uh, 
here's the oxyguanosine with a second pKa of 6.5. If you just have this sort of isosteric hydrocarbon side chain, it's much less acidic, so it's not surprising that that molecule has no biological activity. If the, put to oxygen in beta position, it's more acidic, but still no biological activity. But PMEG is really one of the most potent and one of the most toxic molecules around. It has no selectivity, interacts with all polymerases. Uh, and you can see that in an electronic sense, it, what that tuning of the essence of Tony's invention here all those years ago is to open up this class of compounds with that type of uh, understanding. So three molecules in the series went on to become drugs, Cydofovir, Adefovir, and Tenofovir. Cydofovir was the one that advanced the most rapid. Uh, these other, oops, sorry. These other two I'll talk about in more detail, but it's Tenofovir that came to be the really important drug for HIV and hepatitis B. Oh, sorry. And that's because of this methyl group. It's only methyl PMEA. And only in that R configuration do we get the selectivity. And I'll give details about that. First, uh, Cydofovir, because it has the, uh, uh, what is the equivalent of the three prime OH group of a nucleotide, is incorporated in DNA and had a significant amount of toxicity. And here is something else very special about nucleotides. As you measure them in tissue culture, they don't seem very potent. As you can see, it's less active than acyclovir against herpes simplex. One of the things we did note on early on is, is that if you wash cell, if you put the drug on cells, then wash it, take away the supernate and replace it. Uh, uh, a uh, cell treated with cydofovir will be protected for infection. Cells treated with acyclovir won't be. Another very important feature of nucleotides that we knew very early in the game. So even though it's less active than acyclovir against herpes simplex, in an animal model, it's much more active. You can see 100% protection at 10 mg per kg, where it takes 200 to get to that with acyclovir. So what we see is, is in vivo versus in vitro, there's about a thousand times increase in potency, understanding that nucleotides have very special pharmacology in the body. So cydofovir was approved for CMV retinitis in AIDS patients, and the clinical study was very, very straightforward. Note that there are only 23 patients deferred and 25 receiving cydofovir. So an ophthalmologist can look and take a picture of the enlarging uh, retinal lesion in the eye that leads to blindness and either treat immediately or defer therapy and see this type of a big difference. The other thing about cydofovir, it was only given once every two weeks and still had this type of potency. So that was a phenomenal activity that led to approval on a very small number of patients for the treatment of this retinitis. At the time, this was approved in June of 96. We came out here uh, as one of our many, many visits and held this press conference at the academy. And of course, Tony's doing all the talking, right? And there, that's Mike Reardon, uh, who was the CEO of Gilead, Evan Vortruba, who uh, Tomas Silar received his PhD with, Martinek, who was the head Norbert Bischoff-Berger, still head of R&D, Bill Lee, who's also sitting here in the front row, and Mick Hitchcock, who's been our colleagues all these years. He worked with me and Eric and Tony at Bristol Myers and is, is still working with Gilead. And in fact, he, Bill Prusoff, Eric and I, five years ago, wrote up the history of D4T in a review article. So major players. Norbert and I came back in October of the same year. It seems like I was here at least twice a year for quite a few years. It, this is sitting in Tony's office. That original paper of nucleotides that was published in Nature in 1996, there was a statement in there that foresaw the future. And that is that uh, 
these agents should be exploited further for their inhibitory effects on the AIDS virus. And in fact, the PMEA from the first publication was the molecule we took forward first for HIV and for hepatitis B. And our H, oops, yeah, and here a year, a few months later, because the other picture is October 96, uh, in February 97, we were back. And here, here's, uh, oops, keep hitting the wrong button. Here's Ludmilla, here's Donna, who are both here today in the front row. And Norbert had designed uh, this plate uh, that has the structure of Tenofovir on it. So 18 years ago, we were here at uh, Tony's house uh, talking about where Tenofovir would eventually take us. So again, I want to point out that PMEA was the first one to go forward, adefavir, then tenofovir was second, and it, with the key was the methyl group. So to make PMEA into a drug, we need to have a pro-drug, pro and that's adefavir dipavoxyl, achieved oral bioavailability. The nucleotides themselves are not orally absorbed. And this is a study in HIV patients showing the development of kidney toxicity. And this was the really, really big setback at one point that uh, uh, Tony, Eric, and I uh, commiserated about for many years, that we did not expect this to happen. This kidney toxicity is, was dose proportional, but it was delayed. It didn't occur until patients were on drug for about six months. And because of this toxicity, adefavir never made it to the market for HIV. It might have made it to the market as a salvage drug, but because tenofovir has come along behind, we already had phase two data, we just went ahead to tenofovir for HIV. However, adefavir, dipavoxyl, or brand name Hepsera, was approved for the treatment of hepatitis B and has saved many, the lives of many patients with hepatitis B. It took people off the transplant list for hepatitis B, but it's ultimately, ultimately superseded by tenofovir or viriad in 2008 as a far more potent and selective inhibitor of hepatitis B. So then tenofovir had advanced in the clinic and as a prodrug that it was a novel prodrug development compound that was uh, discovered by Bill Lee and his colleagues that has high oral bioavailability and reliably delivering tenofovir to cells in the body. Tenofovir, as I said, was superseded defovir for hepatitis B. And this was one of the most remarkable results that we had seen in that after five years of treatment of hepatitis B, patients' liver fibrosis and cirrhosis improved. The replication of the virus in the liver causes a stiffening and ultimately liver failure and death. It can also cause liver cancer in quite a high percentage of the patients. And you can see that 28% of the patients at the initiation of therapy had such severe, severe livers that they were actually had cirrhosis. And pictorially, you can see that the, the cirrhosis improves. And in fact, 74% of the patients that were cirrhotic, per, percent of them did not have cirrhosis after five years. So the liver is actually regenerating and improving itself when the virus is being inhibited. Here's one of my favorite pictures. Uh, Tony's always uh, very diligent in his experimentation. You can see he's already chalked his stick, he's lined it up, and he has his everything uh, really sorted out. And that's the way he always planned things very carefully. Uh, that's my transition to HIV and uh, tenofovir. And one important thing is, is that the tenofovir actually is a prodrug in the bloodstream it is a little bit more stable than indefavir and so it more reliably load, loads target lymphocytes where HIV replicates. So a much smaller dose of oral TDF 
delivers the same amount of active diphosphate to cells, PBMCs, as a higher dose of subcutaneous tenofovir itself. And that'll be a theme that I'll come back to later. So this was a study in uh, patients. So at the time, uh, patients were failing therapy. We had three drug regimens, but they weren't very good, and patients who develop resistance. So the idea was that you're supposed to put patients on three new drugs. It takes three drugs to control the virus. But in fact, patients often didn't have three new options. So we were able to design a study where we just add tenofovir or TDF on top of whatever the patient's taking, either immediately or do it after six months. And you can see there's an immediately decline. Uh, even though this is adding a single drug to fail and regimen, we don't see resistance development. And the patients who are deferred still got the benefit when they got on drug. So it's a very simple study. It led to approval of TDF in 2001. To further evaluate TDF, we'd also want to be sure that it has the safety profile that would allow to be a potent broad spectrum once daily pill for HIV. So this is Tomas Selar, who graduated from here and is here today. And I think everyone in the room knows him. Uh, the, here's adefavir, and there's tenofovir. And adefavir is incorporated into mitochondrial DNA at a much higher level than tenofovir. And that was the fundamental insight that led to the selection of tenofovir. Adefavir was a potent, simple molecule acting against HIV that had unexpected toxicities that limited its utility in, uh, for HIV and hepatitis B. Whereas this difference is the safety profile of tenofovir that uh, ended up revolutionizing medicine. So for instance, we did a study that compares TDF to D4T with the two other most common agents that a patient would take at the time and looked at mitochondrial related toxicities of uh, peripheral neuropathies, lipodystrophy, and lactic acidosis. And you can see that there's really a stunning difference that D4T is not the drug you'd want to take if uh, tenofovir was available. And tenofovir, of course, replaced D4T very rapidly. And we had similar types of data versus ACT. Here's something that's kind of uh, really so directly obvious. Patients with HIV uh, uh, waste away. And uh, it's a very difficult disease. And at this time, it was very hard to, to manage the therapies. However, you start a therapy, whether D4T or tenofovir, and you, patients immediately feel better and over the course of six months gain quite a bit of weight. The difference, though, subsequent to that is dramatic. Patients on tenofovir feel better and keep getting better. Patients on D4T lose weight because of the toxicity of the drug. So that is a dramatic difference that led uh, also to tenofovir's use. So at this time, we know that we have a molecule that's potent, doesn't readily give rise to resistance, and is very safe compared to the other therapies for people to take. But yet, people still fail ther therapy because they have to take multiple pills of three different drugs multiple times per day with and without food, and it's just very hard to uh, maintain that. And patients should take all or nothing. If you miss some of the pills, that's when the virus starts to creep back, replicate with some of the drugs there, and develop resistance. So we felt that it would be very important to come up with a single tablet regimen and that that would advance the use of tenofovir as the backbone of therapy for HIV. So we, we felt that uh, by having a simple regimen, you could treat people earlier in disease, treat more people, and have better health outcomes. Improve, it's not only just improving compliance, but it's avoiding that partial regimen is important. And then if you can treat healthier people, we felt it wasn't still proved, but it would seem scientifically obvious. If the virus is suppressed in a person's body, they're going to be far less likely to be able to transmit the virus to someone else. 
So treatment as a method of prevention. So the, the next thing that happened was the acquisition of FTC or intricytabine that was uh, a product being developed by Triangle Pharmaceuticals. And the, the only company that could make a case for developing intricytabine was Gilead because we had tenofovir on the market. It's the perfect pair for tenofovir. Uh, Intricytidine has higher affinity than lamivudine for reverse transcriptase. It's more potent against HIV-1. And importantly, it has a longer intracellular half-life to match it for once daily dosing. So you can see here, tenofovir, long intracellular half-life, FTC, compared to uh, lamivudine, but much better for once daily dosing. And then there is another drug out there marketed by uh, Br uh, Bristol-Myers and Merck called Efavirenz that had long half-life. So the point was, we got FTC from Triangle, then we negotiated a deal for Favrin so we could come up with the first single tablet regimen. So this is what it was like before. No one in this room could take all those pills. Day in, day out, year in, year out. People can acquire HIV in their teens or 20s. If, if they suppress the virus and stay on their regimen, they'll live a normal lifespan. If they don't, they run out of treatment options. So. As I was describing, here's the co combination of tenofovir, TDF, and FTC to form drug Truvada, which was launched in 2004. And then the once daily tablet when Efavirenz was combined with Truvada was launched in 2006. That was such an important advance for the treatment of AIDS patients. FDA, which normally takes up to a year to prove the drug, pr approved a triplet in only 10 weeks. So everyone would say, you just mix those three drugs together and you make a pill, right? But it doesn't work that way. We took five separate formulations into clinical research in humans before we found one that works. And the key thing was, is you can't formulate this with this directly together. You, you can't mix them together and have it dispersed properly and be orally absorbed. So we had to come up with a way to make a bilayer where Truvada's on one side of the pill and Favrin's is on the other. And so this is the scheme where that works. You can see a Favrin's is processed separately from uh, Truvada. And then they come together here into bins and they're fed into a tablet pressing machine. They'll make a two-sided tablet. And it's amazing this technology exists today. It, for a billion dollars, you could have one of these. That there's 59 different tablet presses in this machine working together. So 59 pills at a time, over 1,000 pills a minute can come out of this machine. It's just really remarkable technology. And to think that we were able to do that in the time frame we did, collaborate with uh, Bristol Myers and Burke, uh, and get this product to the market so there'd be a single tablet for HIV is remarkable. Since then, we've launched, uh, actually now three, I'll get to that, but up until recently, we launched two additional single tablets. Uh, one's in collaboration with Johnson Johnson, that's real pilfering. And the other is an integrase l 5 that we developed, that we licensed from Japan Tobacco, our partner in Japan for HIV. We took that over after phase two. And we, we developed a booster to increase the levels of l vitagavir so that it would be sustainable in the blood. So these products uh, are on the market. The Stride build is recently as 2012. And the, the, the simplification of therapy has changed medicine for the treatment of HIV. This is a cohort followed by Julio Montaner in uh, British Columbia showing more and more people had the virus undetectable in the blood. The key is if you have the virus undetectable in the blood, you're gonna be healthy, your immune system's gonna go down, you're not gonna transmit it. And at the same time, the number of resistance, even though 
or even because the number of resistance mutations almost go away, and the number of people, in spite of the fact the number of people on therapy went up dramatically. So that, this is the time frame on these slides is really, as you can see, follows the launch of tenofovir and then the simplification of therapy. Right now, this is data from earlier this year, 79% of people in the United States take one of these tenofovir-based regimens. So four out of five people in the U.S. on <coughs> HIV therapy or on a product who had this vision came right here in this building uh, 30 years ago. There's another thing that uh, once you have safe therapies, uh, people start thinking more aspirationally about how to use it. And so we actually have a study now that says if you treat people, they don't uh, transmit the virus. That's this HPN052 that Mike Cohen published in 2011. And that was the science breakthrough of the year that year. Then we have these additional studies listed there that shows the earlier you treat, the better the health outcomes. It's not just abstract. Uh, when the drugs were toxic, we'd wait till people were kind of sick before we'd treat them. But the earlier you treat, even though someone appears to be healthy, that virus is doing damage and you want to treat right away. Another thing emerged in this time frame, and there's a lot of experiments really going back to Eric's earliest work in tissue culture that what I mentioned earlier, how you can pre-treat a cell, take away the drug, and the cell can't be infected even for 48 hours. It, then there was studies done in animals that confirmed that you can give Truvada, Viriad or Truvada, but Truvada is better, to animals and completely block retrovirus infections. And that's been replicated in humans with Truvada. Truvada was actually approved in the United States three years ago as a pill for HIV negative people at risk of acquiring HIV. And now there's been, there have been studies that came out earlier this year from London and Paris that have demonstrated how well this works. That we're now, Truvada is now recommended by the U.S. Pharmaceutical Health Service, WHO, and UNAIDS for the treatment of high-risk individuals to prevent acquisition of HIV. This was a product that was used in this manner but only by people highly in the know and highly experienced in treating AIDS docs. But now we have over 40,000 people this year in the United States taking Truvada because of this increasing scientific data that's come out in tens of thousands of people and studies that have established uh, this other really unique component of tenofovir for prevention. I want to switch now. So I've covered three nucleotides. They're on the market. And they're the only three nucleotides. They were the first three nucleotides to the market. I uh, want to briefly cover TAF. And again, this is uh, research that shows, I showed you an earlier slide, how TDF targets five times more than Tanafir. 7340, or TAF, if it's known now, targets more than 100 times better. And that's just simply because this uh, gives higher intracellular levels of tenofovir diphosphate. And it just shown schematically on this slide that TAF is more stable, uh, so better able to get in cells and be hydrolyzed by specific enzyme, capsaicin A, to tenofovir. And once it goes down that path, it's just like water flowing over uh, a a uh, uh, dam, it just keeps coming over because as soon as TAF is converted to this, more TAF will come in. And that allows for very, very potent activity. And so you can see here that this is TDF at 300 milligrams and TAF at lower doses, giving much more of the intracellular diphosphate, the active species that hits the virus. And you can also see these two doses of TAF are also much more potent than TDF in human clinical studies. And so we, because these two are similar, we selected the red or the 25 milligram dose to develop for HIV and hepatitis B. And so this product right here 
I can happily tell you that a couple of weeks ago was approved in the U.S. as Genvoya. It's the first TAF STR to the market, and it'll be approved in the European Union before the end of this year. And the other products are all under development. This is under review for, with the FDA. This version of Truvada or FTAF is under review FDA in Europe also. And we expect phase three data from large hepatitis B studies before the end of this year. So what we have in TAF is something that is now demonstrably better than TDF in humans because of its lower side effect profile. We're given 25, the equivalent, we're given you know, less than one-tenth the amount of tenofovir. So we see less bone and kidney toxicity. We also have a product because it's a lower dose, will be more economical to manufacture and di distribute in low-income countries. So now I'd like to just talk briefly about hepatitis C. It's, it's another nucleotide that we have on the market. The prevalence of hepatitis C at 80 million people who are viremic is two and a half times the number of HIV. Again, it's a nucleotide and it's a phosphoroamidate, uh, so it has an amidate like TAF that, uh, oh, sir, because of its, uh, it's, it's like, uh, like tenofovir, you see broad spectrum activity, potent once daily dosing, high barrier to risk resistance, and it's been on the market for less than two years. Hepatitis C is a disease that uh, infects a lot of people in my age group called baby boomers who uh, have acquired it through largely medical practice long before we knew there was hepatitis C. In fact, there wasn't a diagnosis test for hepatitis C until just over 20 years ago. So there's been a lot of transmission of hepatitis C in different parts of the world by blood transfusions. Uh, we really started out in sort of the last 20 years using comp interferon ribavirin in different regimens. Less than 5% of people who are sick can tolerate it. And the cure rate was on around 50%. But as we came forward with sofosphere and then sofosphere plus ledipasphere, we're seeing cure rates above 95%. So, Sofosphere is emerging much like, for hepatitis C, much like tenofovir, it's the backbone of therapy. And ledipasphere or velpatosphere are both NS5A inhibitors. This product's been on the market, Harvoni, for about a year now. We just released data in, stud, in presentations on Monday or Tuesday of this week in San Francisco at a liver conference that shows our next regimen gives 95, greater than 95% cure rates in all patients without ribavirin in all genotypes with the same regimen, once a day for 12 weeks. This is gonna be very important in the vast parts of the world where hepatitis C has prevalence, but the diagnostic test and the management is too expensive. Simplifying therapy this way has really been transforming the care of hepatitis C. And so just basically in the first six quarters, so Foster is on the market and then Harvoni, you can see a pretty impressive uptake of the number of people who are availing themselves of a cure of uh, hepatitis C. And as always, the U.S. leads the way. Approvals come faster and updates faster. Uh, but this curve is going to continue to go up, and we're especially gratified to see that low-income countries, we have a substantial adoption already. So that's what I'd like to finish up with, is an access model that I appreciate has been supported by the Institute all these years. It's uh, something that Eric and Tony have actively encouraged and supported through the, the way we manage our collaboration. It's something, of course, we're all very proud of also. We didn't know it would work. What we started you know, about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, was to uh, 
transfer technology to Indian generic companies so they could manufacture large scale and deliver tenders to the various programs that provide AIDS products throughout the world. And so we uh, transfer the technology that allows a company to develop and make the product available, let's say, to PEPFAR in the United States in five months instead of two years at low cost. Um, just for instance, for HIV, there's over 35 million people in the world with HIV. The numbers are getting a lot better. A few years ago, there were more people getting infected and there were more people dying every year than were being treated for HIV. And we can see that that's reversing, but there's still 1.2 million people dying, 2 million people become infected. But out of the 36, 15 million people are accessing therapy, which is something that we never would have projected when we started working together. Um, these access countries covered 90% of the people with HIV in the world. And when we were here with the slides I showed at the beginning in 2011, I showed a slide through 2010 showing how many people are on tenofovir, uh, what of those, what percent are on the brand and what percent are in generic drug. And you can see how phenomenal that's been since 2011 that we now have over 8 million people in low-income countries on tenofovir. So more than half of the people in Africa and other low-income parts of the world that uh, are taking a product that at its beginning here 30 years ago. In fact, nine, you can see that the brand is virtually gone because there's no way Gilead can manufacture at that volume and at, at that discounted price. So th that, that's a price-driven thing and that's uh, transformed the lives of people. And people in, all over the world are now taking single tablet regimens that began right here in this institute that, that many of you have been involved in all these years to be a part of that. So this is kind of a summary of the timeline. That uh, There's the Nature paper that was published in 1986. AZT, the first, that was before there was a single drug for the treatment of HIV. AZT was the first drug and yet everyone was failing and dying. It took until 1996 before there were enough pills on the market that a patient could take three separate pills and fully control the virus. But again, as I said earlier, there's so many pills that people were dying anyway. And then we start transforming everything. TDF, Truvada, FTC, Atripla. A couple years ago, WHO, said a tripla with either FTC or 3TC is the only first line agent we recommend for the developing world. Imagine that the World Health Organization recommends uh, Tadafavir as it. Then uh, PrEP recently gained acceptance. I guess I need to update this slide to say Gen Genvoy has now been approved and we will continue to bring out these additional TAF-based <coughs> STRs and continue to expand access to people around the world. So in summary, you know, scientific innovation works really well. I appreciate Stenick's comments about the, the, the difference of our industry versus other industry. If it not for certain individuals at certain points in times, maybe Tanafir never would have been a drug. But we really, oops, sorry. We really do know how to uh, advance patient care and do it rapidly in rapid development programs and do all the science like, for instance, the bilayer of a tripla or what Tomas did to identify that five meth, I mean, the two prime R methyl, a defavir would have such a unique property. We know how to do that and we're doing them. A really good job compared to where we were 10 years ago on creating access around the world to these products and that's something I know that uh, Tony would always ask me about how's that going what are we doing there and 
It was really a great interest of his, and um, I know he's very proud of that. I know all of you are very proud to have been a part of that. And so that on that, I think I can cl cl close, congratulate you on uh, being a part of this thing that happened in Prague over the last 30 years. And thank you very much for having me here today. I think we have a few, few minutes for questions still, right, Stan? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Who's going to help me? <laughs> so, oh, oh, oh. so, yes, we have uh, several minutes for questions, or maybe 10, ten more minutes. But before we approach the questions, you know, I, I have uh, to share some insider information uh -huh. from Gilead that actually there is still some free wall space in your office. Oh, okay. And uh, <laughs> we are here to fill it. And uh, you showed the big plaque you received as a Holy Trinity at a certain point of time. We are getting much more modest but compressed. <laughs> like, like, you know, those 20 pills. Yeah. Uh, here's one. So here's here's one, one pill. <laughs> and uh, so we have the honor to present you with a pill where Tenofovir is uh -huh. prominently projected, our logo. And uh, clearly your name in appreciation of what you did for, for the business and for the chemistry. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Well, I think he's... Uh, okay. So this closes the very official part. Yeah. The words have been uh, distributed. And the questions. Now we are getting into hardcore science. You are on the spot. Over well, fortunately, Bill there. and Tomas are here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, a backup Tomas and uh, Bill are here, and Eric, you know, if there are some uncertainties. So please. Pick up. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Who else? Yes. <laughs> well, very nice talk, but you, you haven't covered the transfer from Bristol Myers to together. And I, I think we, we all are interested in how, how, how this happened and uh, how, how you built your first investors for, for the effort and they were in, in California. I think this part is a Yeah, so, uh, well, that's, I sort of alluded to that when I uh, thanked uh, Eric and Tony for their loyalty all these years because uh, there was, when Bristol Myers and Squibb merged, there was a lot of turmoil. And so to avoid delay, um, somehow we worked this out. I went to Gilead, and when the Bristol Myers license was terminated, we already, Tony, Eric, and I met in Paris, like the 4th of July, 1991. Well, for me, it was the, I was gone on the 4th of July, I mean. <laughs> That's our holiday. So we, we met on the 2nd of July, and we actually met in a cafe and signed an agreement that Gilead would take it over, but it took until November to get all the paperwork done. And then when we got all the paperwork in November, the Bristol sent us all the things we needed except for some key documents. So Bill had to fly to Syracuse in December, which you know is the coldest place on the planet, and get the remaining documents from Bristol Myers. We also, uh, because of that, we went public in January. So July signed, November got the rights, December Bill went and got the last of the paperwork. January went public and financed the development. And it's really that simple. <laughs> you have anything to add? <laughs> no, he, no, okay. All right, next question. Lubos. This HCV drugs, I mean, that they pass here, I mean, they, we are told sometimes that there are these living skis rules, you know, and you never believe they, no chemist would ever accept that they could be a drug. So what we do, I didn't cover it for time reason, they're, they're spray dried. 
And so you, you have a big vessel that's either, you know, sort of a suspension that has the drug dissolved in it, so it's organic solvents, and you go through a spray dryer that is 50% higher than the ceiling. And so it goes in the top, and it, it's 50-50 a polymer, copov copovidone, copovidone, and the drug. And that allows that complicated lipophilic molecule that has high molecular weight to uh, be completely disordered. And we get very reliable or, uh, 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 oral bioavailability. And we can go from small scale to large scale. We can uh, go to like 400 kilos an hour, I think, right? Something like 400 kilos an hour. Uh, there wasn't much capacity in the world. One of our biggest challenges is with the rapid uptake of drugs for hepatitis C. And I should say there's something else. Uh, when we acquired sofosfavir, we, we combined it with lidiposphere and we convinced U.S. and European regulatory authorities we could skip phase two. So that put enormous pressure on the company, that very rapid development. And w fortunately, there was a, a very large spray dryer that was built for a product that failed in phase three, which of course is common in our industry. So there's this huge spray dryer sitting in Ireland that had no drug to run in it. And that, that really saved the day for us, that we were able to just step right in there and at uh, a, a, a CMO and take over that capacity. That was a good question. <laughs> Another question is, what is the next virus to be, to be treated? <laughs> so, uh, a few people may know this, but Tom, Tomas is the project manager for our Ebola virus program. And when Ebola virus came out in Africa, 30,000 people were rapidly infected and half of them died. And so, we collectively said, we need to have a product for Ebola. And we are looking at nucleotides for respiratory syncytial virus, and there was some, he can tell you all about it, there was some predictive uh, ability to identify which compounds to screen. And of course, we don't test Ebola virus at Gilead. There's only very few places in the world that can work with Ebola virus. But we did screen our compounds and had uh, a couple external labs agree with the ranking then took them into monkeys and were able to completely protect monkeys from Ebola. And so now that product has been uh, used, the, the example that's widely known is the Scottish nurse that had a relapsing uh, Ebola virus and was near death in London, was treated with this product. And we can't say it cured her, but she's out of the hospital now. And so. <laughs> It's a very, very exciting program, and it has activity against a lot of the emerging viruses. So any of you that want to know more about that, <laughs> uh, you can call him at our receptions and stuff today. So I would have a follow-up to the question with a slight strategic component. <laughs> the, the, the viral diseases and infectious diseases in general, some people say this is the easy part of medicine, because actually it so happens, as you well know, that your in vitro models are very predictive. If you find a compound which is active in vitro in viral sort of control systems, it's very likely to work well in humans. But as you also mentioned, we are in the baby boomers generation and our big problems are perhaps not uh, viral diseases, but it's cancer and mental dementia and Alzheimer's and stuff like that. And those two aspects are notoriously difficult to predict in your in vitro systems. And I noticed in Gilead, you venture into cancer, for instance. So what's your thought about, you know, how to proceed or, or you know, are you trying to forget what you learn with antivirals, the easy part, and how do you cope with a difficulty? Yeah. Well, I'd first say that uh, when it's all done and it's so successful, and I talk about it, of course, it looks very easy, right? But, you know, er Erica has struggled through all these generations. Uh, uh, when we don't know how to test stuff, 
we, we used to not know how to, we didn't have PCR, we didn't know how to measure HIV. Hepatitis B, we, it, regulatory bodies, you had to do biopsies to show approval. Uh, there's there's uh, very, very little available to, there wasn't an in vitro system for hepatitis C. There's no animal model for hepatitis C, so there, there's a lot of work. Uh, I believe that we're very fortunate to be living in a time where science advances so fast and that techniques we can't imagine today are available to us tomorrow. And the other important thing is that there's access to capital, that you can invest in pro projects for many, many, many years before making the return. And in fact, I spend a lot of my time uh, dealing with sort of policy makers and these types of issues so that people recognize the value of funding research, like what's going on here at IOCB, so that we can have these advances in the future products uh, for those of us who are in the group that were aging and th the diseases you mentioned. Uh, much, especially in oncology, we have a pretty significant effort under Bill Lee's guidance to do exactly the same thing as we uh, did with HIV, to come up with products that work by different mechanisms that can suppress the cancer and not allow it to mutate and get, find a way to get resistance and get around that pathway. So I would like to thank you for, and thank you to Bill and Tomas for, for that kind, yeah. uh, I would say, agreement or, or nodding towards, yes, we will continue. <laughs> it's extremely important. I, I have to say that's why I took this opportunity for people sitting here, and I think they would take it as a great, great news of this afternoon. Let's switch back to science.